included a lot of um, kind of physical uh, limitations of your rig, uh, where to put your counterweights, um, the mount capacity, uh, mount specifics like periodic error and things, cable management, uh, how to achieve good focus, polar alignment, environmental sensors, and dew prevention. And that all kind of went under the just setting setting everything up except the um, except the the acquisition part the uh, you know the telescope the cameras anything like that um, and this t uh, and that was sort of this three pillars of of a good image that that I went over last time mm -hmm. uh, to remind you it's uh, mechanics so you got to have a good foundation of your your setup um, the optics uh, how the light is collected into each individual pixel and then the the pixel and everything downstream from that so the electronics uh, how the camera responds to temperature read noise um, uh, and and that will in the end tell you whether you get a, a good image from from those frames or not and so this time i'm doing optics and um, electronics will come in november so uh, and I'm sure we all know this, but I just wanted to cover it just for sake of being thorough. Uh, the telescope, the two really big um, factors I see in the telescope when considering uh, which telescope to use for imaging are aperture and focal length. And they both uh, do, they, they both are sensitive to, to different things. So a larger aperture means that you can more finely resolve smaller things. Uh, because it's a larger aperture, there's less of a diffraction limit on on the size of of stars, um, so you can you can image um, with higher resolution. The other uh, flip side of that is focal length. Uh, so the longer focal length you have, the more quote magnification. I put that in quotes because visually that you do turn it into a magnification with an eyepiece. Uh, for imaging, that translates into a pixel scale. So it it. It means a, a finer pixel scale by which you can um, sample the sky. So there are some uh, general, this, this outline shows just sort of, uh, this figure shows sort of general construction of the telescope with an objective for a refractor, you have an object, objective lens or lens cell. Uh, the baffling along the, the inner tube, which cuts out stray light. And then your image sensor will be on the imaging plane, which is typically where the field stop is for the eyepiece. So the imaging plane of the camera is quite a bit farther in than where you typically, uh, than where you would um, view the object with, a, with an eyepiece. Uh, and then you can compare just, th th this is kind of a neat sketch because I, I like that you can compare the uh, entrance pupil to the exit pupil and that's a direct scaling of magnification. So the entrance pupil divided by the exit pupil gives you the magnification. Um, likewise, the focal length ratios give you the magnification. For our purposes for imaging, it's all about how big each pixel is on the, the, uh, the focal plane uh, and its relation to the, fo uh, to the focal length. And, that, and that'll tell you um, what, the, uh, what the image scale is. Okay, so uh, because this is a circular aperture, um, what you see on the on the focal plane is not uh, just a pinpoint of light. It, it's it reflects the wave nature of light. Uh, it's called the airy disk, and um, you have a central bright spot. And then, because it's constructively and destructive, destructively interfering waves, depending on where those waves come in through the aperture of um, of your telescope, you'll have this circular um, zero. In intensity and then another maximum that's the first outer ring and then another circular zero of intensity so there's there's no there are no photons gathering in this in each of these zeros uh, where, where these are minima most of the photon energy is is concentrated in in the the central spot of the airy disk and that's uh, that's often used to determine uh, sort of the quality of the, of the optical instrument um, so yeah, this is kind of, a, I, I would say that this is a, a very um, nonlinear representation. This is the linear representation where it's instead of these, this bright ring here, it looks fairly bright. It's actually quite a bit dimmer than that. Uh, if you look at this, this is a kind of a cross section, a horizontal cross section of this airy disc. 
and you see that the center is at maximum one, and then that first node or that for, that first uh, outer ring uh, has a very um, very low amplitude, so it's actually quite dim. But um, but nonetheless, you can still resolve it, and with a bright star, you can see it visually through the eyepiece, uh, and that's what's used a lot for testing um, uh, telescopes to see if if there are any aberrations, and uh, if if you're into that kind of thing. Um, I highly recommend this book by Suter. It's, uh, it's great. It, it goes through uh, many optical systems and, and sort of diagnoses what this should look like with different optical um, aberrations. It's pretty neat. <clears throat> okay, um, next. So with, uh, I said here that the larger aperture, the more detail can be resolved. So the larger aperture means that this spot size is smaller. And the separation of uh, nearby spot sizes gives you um, the if you can if you can separate those uh, by eye, then you can you can resolve them. And historically, this resolving power or this result or resolving scale is kind of um, determined by how these overlap. So uh, the the Rayleigh criterion states that if the maximum of one star falls into that first minimum, that's sort of the, the best you can do for resolving the two. Um, and so you can see that if you have a larger aperture, that first minimum goes in towards the star and you can start to resolve them, them more easily. If you have a smaller aperture, these that first minimum uh, expands and would envelop the other star. And so they would just merge into sort of one blob that you can't really resolve into two individual stars. And this principle um, doesn't only work for visible light, it works for all um, frequencies of light. Uh, so uh, this is a, a plot of the resolution that you would expect versus the, this, uh, the size of your, your telescope. So in the visual, this is the, the aperture of your refractor, say, uh, for uh, things like radio. It might be the aperture of the of the dish that you're using for radio astronomy, or it could be uh, the baseline length of the of any sort of um, array of of dishes that that are used in for interferometry. And so, uh, for example, if we use uh, around uh, the size of the the pupil for the for the human eye, it's about um, anywhere between 10 to 100 arc seconds. So roughly around an arc minute, let's say. For, for the human eye. Um, if you go to a four inch telescope, it gets to about one arc second for a visible light. And then if you go to a one meter scope, it's around 0.1 arc seconds. Um, so that's that's kind of shows you how this scales. It scales, um, uh, it scales inversely proportional to the diameter. So the higher diameter, the smaller the, the scale that you can resolve. Um, which is important for getting really good detail in your images. Uh, questions? I realize that some of this might be a bit overview. I mean, uh, we're all uh, amateur astronomers, so a lot of this is kind of known, but uh, I want to frame this within the context of imaging. Uh, Gabe, uh, yep. down, down the road, are you going to, one of, one of the interesting things about this is, is then comparing this to, you know, this is your theoretical limit, right? Um, but you know what is you know what is the limiting factor relative to i'm sorry hold on uh limiting factor relative to the actual you know camera detector right uh that i'm not presenting uh in this set of talks i would have liked to have done that okay. um but i have i do have a, a several plots that i've made a couple of years ago that kind of at home towards that and I can share those after. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Next. So as um, as the aperture of your telescope increases, this first node uh, gets closer to the, the centroid of the star. Uh, and, and that's a reflection of just the better resolution that that larger aperture has. Another effect is uh, whether there are aberrations. And so if there's an aberration in the, in the telescope, 
it can kind of smear this, this airy disk uh, considerably depending on the aberration. For a perfect telescope, it should appear like this or, or like this in a linear uh, view. Um, and so this is a more linear view. You can see the spot and then there's a very faint first ring and then a, a faint, slightly fainter outer ring. And on this screen, I can't resolve anything beyond that second ring. Uh, so that's sort of what you would uh, what you would really see through the through the telescope, and this concept of modulation transfer function, what it does is it it looks at how uh, spatial frequencies um, are resolved in uh, in your telescope. So it's a very low spatial frequency. So this horizontal axis of spatial frequencies cycles per millimeter. Uh, this is this you could also view as sort of maybe um, modulation per arc second or modulation per arc minute, uh, just whatever sort of area subtended by this uh, modulating um, signal uh, is the spatial frequency. And this uh, vertical axis tells you sort of the, in this case it's arbitrary units, but it tells you the contrast. So it tells you how bright the bright regions are versus what they should be and how dark the dark regions are in, in your measurement through this optical system versus what they should be. As you increase the spatial frequency, this contrast ratio decreases. And this, is, this line right here is an example of an ideal system where we have just a, a, a circular aperture, no aberrations, and it's perfectly um, focusing the, the light uh, into, into an image. And so this would be an example uh, test pattern that, that people, that people use often in um, assessing cameras. Um, I haven't really seen it done for telescopes. It, it probably is also done for telescopes. But the idea here is that this outer band shows you um, the very low frequency. So this is modulating dark, bright, dark, bright um, in this outer band. As you go towards the center of this, uh, the modulation becomes faster uh, per millimeter in this image. And um, you can see that you, you have really sharp resolution, really sharp, sharp contrast, but it, as you go in, that contrast degrades. And the degradation of that contrast is a reflection of this curve. And this, this happens for this, uh, this optical setup, even though it's ideal, it happens and it's just a, a, a result of the physics where we can't resolve anything finer than, um, than what uh, the Rayleigh uh, criterion tells us. Uh, if we move to a, a telescope that does have aberrations, and in this case, it's a severe aberration, we have a lot more energy of uh, intensity of light that's in this first band and outer bands. Uh, I can resolve by eye, I can resolve out to six, six rings or so, um, whereas here I can only uh, detect two. So there's a lot more of that light thrown out into those outer bands. And looking at the, the pattern here, this modulation, you can already see that the, these edges between the light and dark are not as sharp. Um, and what that is, is it's just kind of smearing the, the bright and the dark together, making the bright less bright, making the dark less dark. And so the contrast is, is not as strong. And what happens as you go towards the center of this circle, where you're getting those higher spatial frequencies, you're losing it, almost any semblance of contrast between them. And that's what's happening in here. So this modulation transfer function tells you how these, these, um, these spatial frequencies kind of manifest into contrast. And ideally we want all spatial frequencies to have really good contrast. So we compare that against the, um, the ideal. And, and that's what this, this one is. So compared to these, this one, uh, this lower portion is, is not ideal at all. Uh, and this comparison of, you could take the area under this curve and compare the two. And that comparison is what's called the Strail ratio. Uh, that's one way to measure it. There are other ways to measure it as well. Um, one is to look at the airy disk and look at where the maximum is. So uh, again, versus a, an idealized airy disk. So it, in, an, in an apparatus or in an optical instrument where the airy disk has the maximum, say here, uh, if I read this right, this would be 0.8. So this first, um, this first dotted li uh, dashed line would have some optical aberration. I don't know exactly what, but the fact that its central maximum is not one, it's 0.8, tells you that the Strail ratio is then 
Uh, and it's often quoted that Strel ratio 0.8 or larger is diffraction limited. Um, and excellent telescopes usually have 0 0.9, 0 0.95 and above. So the closer they are to this ideal modulation transfer function or closer to the ideal airy disk, the better and the better uh, resolution you can get. The closer you are to the physical limitations of the size of your telescope rather than optical aberrations. Um, questions? Is there any way to measure this easily on, uh, in an optical system? Yeah. Um, the Strail ratio, yeah, there is. There's a program called Win Rodier, which I think it was written by a French team, and, and it might still be in French, but I think there might be a tra an English translation uh, ported. But it, it's, it's kind of a neat program. I haven't used it personally, but I did a lot of research in it thinking I was going to use it. Um, what you do is you point to a star, you take an image, and then if you have an electronic focuser, this can really help. You rack in the focuser a certain number of microns, take another image, rack out the same number of microns, take another image, and then it does a, an analysis on the star profile and star shape, intrafocus and extrafocus. And it tells you a lot of these aberrations. It can tell you the, the strail ratio. It can tell you, like for example, if you have um, a turned down edge for a Newtonian, uh, it tells you spherical aberration. Um, it tells you a lot of uh, different information. Uh, so that uh, software, I believe, is able to do those types of things. Good, thanks. Other questions? All right. Um, if you do have a Newtonian or a Cassegrain or um, SCT, uh, you don't have a perfectly circular aperture that all the light can go through. You, you would have a central obstruction. And that central obstruction can throw more energy into the outer ring. Um, a lot of people knock on these telescopes because it's not an idealized area disk, but it's just a limitation of the design that if you have an, a central obstruction, you're going to lose some contrast. The smaller the central obstruction, the better it is because it's more refractor-like. Um, in some cases, their central obstruction can go up to about 50% of the diameter, like in some smaller Ritchie um, telescopes, they can be up to around 50% the diameter and that can, that can cause a lot, of, um, a, a lot of loss of contrast. But there are other design, there are other trade-offs due to the, to the telescope that make it um, more attractive than a refractor. So this is, this is an example of that star profile as it evolves as you increase the central obstruction fraction. So this is no central obstruction for a refractor, 10%, uh, 20%, all the way up to 50%. And you can see how that outer ring really increases uh, intensity. So because there, you know, conservation of energy, uh, there's only, there's so much light coming from the star in, in a given time. There's so much light that your telescope can collect. If some of that light is going to the outer portion, then the central portion loses intensity. And so uh, as we increase the size of the central obstruction, the uh, central maximum loses intensity. And you can read directly off of here what the strail ratio would be in these cases versus an idealized refractor. Um, that said, like I said, um, design limitations are that these telescopes that do have central obstructions, you really can't get around them. So you just kind of have to, to live with it. I would say a four inch telescope versus a, a, you know, a 10, 11 inch SCT. The 10 or 11 inch SCT is obviously going to have a lot better resolution, even though the strail ratio is uh, smaller, just because of the virtue of it, this, the aperture. It's, it's going to make up for it in spades. All right. Um, okay. Any questions about all this stuff? If not, we can move on to the refractor. So I wanted to, before go, diving into telescopic systems, um, I wanted to just review what refraction is. Um, it's a, uh, one of the first telescopes was a refractor invented by Galileo um, over 400 years ago. And it was a simple two lens uh, system. And the lenses themselves, they, they changed the direction of light. And the physical um, reason for that is, is that um, when light moves from one medium to another where uh, the index of refraction changes, um, 
the index of refraction of, of air is around one, very close to one. Um, the index of refraction of a vacuum is I, identically one. It's, it's by definition one. So an air is very close to one. If you go to glass, um, depending on the glass, it's between uh, I think 1.5 and 1.6. And when that change happens, uh, the light bends at that interface. And the reason for that is um, a, a really neat physical consequence called the principle of least action or least time. Um, and so this bending, so this, uh, this would be in the case of air, down here would be glass. Uh, as the light comes in, it has some angle with respect to this, this sort of um, 90 degree uh, normal line here. And as it goes into the glass, it, it steepens. And the reason it steepens is because of this, um, this, cons this principle of least time that I'll go through in a little bit. Uh, this is important because if this interface is completely flat, it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't focus light. But if this interface is curved, then the outer periphery of a lens can be focused differently than the inner part of a lens. And that's what fundamentally, that's what's folding the light uh, a little bit to make it focus into a, a single point. Uh, so that's the, that's the concept behind what a lens does. Um, and Fermat's principle is, um, is just a statement that if you have light needing to go from point A to point B, um, saying there's, there's no interface here, there's no air, water, air, glass interface, light would uh, just go on merely in a straight line because the speed of light along this entire line is constant. As it goes into another medium of different refractive index that, uh, the effective speed of light slows down. And when it slows down, uh, it's, uh, it, it bends. And the reason it bends is because it, it goes from point A to point B in the least amount of time. Uh, and the, uh, there's a nice analogy of this. If you're, uh, if you're a lifeguard and you see a swimmer that needs help, uh, you want to get to that swimmer as soon as possible instead of taking a direct route where you run on land and then swim more slowly on the water, or you run to get as close as possible and then swim, uh, swim more slowly because uh, of the water. These two paths would be longer in time, but there's a compromise in between where you, you run on land as fast as you can and then you swim as fast as you can to get to the swimmer um, uh, as soon as possible. And there's a physical uh, reason for all this, which um, is, is very neat. It, it, it governs not only light, but also all of classical mechanics, um, almost everything that's not quantum, quantum mechanics. And, and you could argue that it also includes quantum mechanics, but most of physics uh, follows this principle. Um, so yeah, that, that's light. And the reason that we can focus light, again, like I said, uh, is that these outer surfaces are curved. If they were just flat, there would be no focusing of light. Uh, questions? By the way, um, you know, like I said last time, it, you know, this is a, I'm, you know, presenting this talk, but of course it's, it's very casual. So if you guys have any questions or comments or, or whatever, just interrupt me. Uh, okay. So I've kind of gone over this. I just wanted to show this uh, again, because that curved surface and, the, and that's what's causing all of the, the cool focusing of light that, that we that we take for granted in our telescopes. Okay, so going into uh, telescopes themselves, um, refractors there are uh, for imaging. Uh, if if we're focusing on a, a just a lens system at the objective end, uh, there are really two main types for imaging: uh, the doublet refractor and the triplet triplet refractor. And the doublet has um, two lenses that are close together. And the reason that they're in doublet is to correct for as much as possible uh, chromatic aberration. Uh, if you use just a single lens, you'll have uh, some severe chromatic aberration as well as uh, some off-axis aberrations. And this doublet construction will, will try to um, tame both of those. Um, it still does have residual chromatic aberration. Uh, I've seen some doublets that have been touted as apo, uh, apochromatic, which apochromatic is supposed to mean um, uh, that uh, there's 
basically no detectable chromatic aberration, that it's, uh, if you point your telescope to something like Vega, a very bright star or Venus, uh, the brightest planet, then you're not gonna see any uh, violet fringing or, or any sort of weird color effects on the, on the periphery of, of the target. Uh, but the doublet, um, most times that I've seen through a doublet, it, it does have that chromatic aberration. Uh, so that's sort of a downside, especially if you're imaging with um, with uh, with color cameras or filters. You'll sometimes have uh, a lot more sort of ballooning or flaring of blue light in these types of telescopes. Uh, the plus side, though, is that it, it's faster for cool down. Uh, you only have one interface between these two uh, lenses and it, it cools down uh, relatively fast compared to the triplet design. Uh, and, and like I said, it's, it's, it's decent, uh, okay for imaging. Uh, in my view, the, the triplet is, if you want really good color um, rendition in your images, the triplet for refractors is, is the good starting place. It's excellent for imaging, uh, great for color correction. Um, because it does have these three, it, it does take longer to equilibrate. So when you start imaging, you just want to set up, you put it out outside earlier to help it cool down faster or to give, just to give it more time to cool down. Um, and then because it also has that, you know, the three, um, three lenses there, it is front heavy. Uh, so balancing it can be difficult on some mounts, but um, it, it just depends on, on how you're set up and what your, your counterweight on the other side of, of the telescope is, whether your camera's heavy or not, or if you can put counterweights over there. Uh, regardless, either of these will have field curvature. So um, that will need to be corrected for. So with that, I wanna go through a little bit of different optical aberrations. Um, the first one, a little segue here is field curvature. So with those refractors, you will have um, uh, what's called field curvature when you move off of this principal axis. Um, so this is the axis going straight down the optical system. Um, if you move off that principal axis, the, actually what um, the light is focusing on this curved surface. So uh, right here is where the focus is rather than uh, where your chip would be over here or over here. So if you put your, your chip indicated in a, you know, a flat plane here and you wanna intersect here, then you're gonna be out of focus in the middle and you're gonna be out of focus on the very edge of this. So that's what the field curvature is, where um, the curved, the, the surface of best focus is, is actually curved. Um, and it's also called the, the Petzval surface, um, which is named for uh, an optician, I think, in the 1800s. Uh, to correct for this, there are a few ways to do it. One is to to add a, a field flattener uh, near the camera end of the telescope, or to have a telescope with a built-in field flattener with kind of like a, well, it is, it's called a Petzval uh, telescope, where you have a, a doublet in the front and then a doublet um, and closer to the, the camera or the eyepiece that does take, take that into account and, and flattens that field. And that's what this is. So there's the, this would be the Petzval uh, design where um, you know, the doublet uh, as the objective and then an additional doublet uh, closer to the imaging plane to, to flatten that, that end. Uh, some examples of a Petzval or FSQ-106, which is an outstanding imaging system. It's uh, natively at F5, so it's very fast. Um, can be reduced, I think, to F3, I think F3 or 3.3, I forget. Uh, and then the Redcat newly, you know, recently released Redcat 51. I think that's uh, f 4.9, uh, and that's also another system that um, that is a Petzl design. Uh, the advantage of the separate fuel flattener is that you can kind of mix and match, you know, mix the, uh, match the fuel flattener with your system. They're readily available. Um, there are a lot of uh, suppliers out there that have different fuel flatteners uh, that you can purchase and use with your system. Some have different backspacing uh, requirements. Most of them are designed to be 55 millimeter, which is the typical backspacing distance of, of cameras. Um, uh, some of them are, are longer, which are more advantageous for cases where you have extra uh, things in between. For example, maybe you have an off-axis guider that eats up, eats up more back focus, 
or if you have a rotator that you use, uh, that could eat up some back, fo back focus too. So some of the fuel flatteners um, uh, that do have those longer uh, back focus distance are, are helpful in that case. The great thing about the pets full design is that you really don't need to care about back focus. It's all designed into the system because this is part of the telescope. And if you focus your imaging plane, you're already guaranteed to be at the right back focus. Uh, there's really no issue with that. The only issue is because it is a more complex system, sometimes it can go out of collimation and you have to send it back to the supplier or manufacturer to get it recollimated. Hey Gabe, um, yep. is, are these a pet, what do you call it, a pets? Petzl, Petzl, yeah. Refractor. Is that also the same? Is it the same thing when you hear them talk about a quad? Yeah. So the quad, I, I, I believe is the same, the same type of, uh, I don't know if it's exactly the same design. It could be, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. It could be a triplet and then a singlet or, uh, in some cases it could be a triplet and a doublet. Um, but it, I think it all operates in, under the same, the same thing where the flattening element is in the telescope and does not be, is not adjusted by the end user. So all you have to do is focus um, onto the, you know, put the CCD onto the focal plane and, and then you should have really good flat field in, in the CCD. Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, so that's field curvature. Uh, other optical aberrations, um, spherical aberration is one which I've seen more visually than uh, through images, uh, mainly because I don't kind of concentrate on what the star shapes look like in an out of focus with the uh, imaging system. But I just wanted to repeat it here just to, just to make sure that everyone's aware of it if you're not. Uh, and really spherical aberration, all it is is saying that the rays on the outer portion of a lens or outer portion of an optical system uh, come to a different focus than the rays on the inner portion of uh, your system. So if I have a ray coming in at, uh, rays coming in at C, it'll focus back here, rays coming in at A uh, with high impact parameter on, on the lens, it'll come in closer. And you can see this uh, with a star test, uh, my, my really nice refractors, they're triplet refractors, they, they still have this. So even though you have a triplet refractor and it's great for color, you can still have spherical aberration. And what that amounts to is um, if, you, if, you look at the, uh, if you look at the star pattern here on uh, out of focus and in focus, they have a different um, distribution of energy. So this is a lot more fuzzy on that outer ring. This is very, very sharp on the outer ring. And then if the aberration is inverted, it's, it's the opposite on, uh, you know, interfocus, it's sharp and on outer, fo outer focus, it's, it's fuzzy. What matters is in focus, when you're getting the best focus possible, the star is just a little bit extra fuzzy. Um, and that's just saying that if you're, if you're putting your chip somewhere along here, where are you going to put it? Um, maybe right here is the best, but ideally you want all those rays coming together at one point. So you can see that sort of the width, or I hope you can see my mouse. You can see that the width of this um, is a lot wider than what you would expect for being perfectly in focus for all the rays converging to one point. So spherical aberration can contribute to some softness in, in your images. Uh, beyond what you would expect from uh, the airy disk. Okay. Um, another aberration is astigmatism. And this happens when uh, rays coming through your optical system um, have different focal lengths depending on what plane they're coming through. So if you concentrate on the blue lines here, the blue rays, that's through the vertical plane outlined on the lens here by this uh, vertical ellipsoid uh, or ellipse here. And they will come into focus farther back compared to the red uh, plane, which comes into focus uh, closer in. Um, so in that comparison, you can see that, excuse me, the sagittal and tangential um, rays will have different focal lengths and that can also affect uh, sharpness. 
So these are examples of st astigmatism with some seeing effects added. Um, slightly defocus inside and out, outside of focus, you can see this vertical shape and then the horizontal shape. And that's a hallmark of astigmatism when you have these types of deformations in the star. Um, and then with the bad example, you have even more extreme uh, cases. Uh, some causes of this could be um, pinched optics. For example, maybe you're stressing the, le uh, the lens in one particular way. That could be caused by cell stress, the, the, the cell that's housing the lens itself, or thermal stress. Maybe, um, maybe the cool down is, is so fast that it's putting, the cell is putting extra stress on the lens, but once it's fully cooled down, there's, everything's in equilibrium. It kind of relaxes back to where it should, and there's less, um, you know, less of a, a deformation there. Okay, uh, and then chromatic aberration. Uh, I touched on this with the doublet example a little bit, and all this is is, is saying that um, different wavelengths of light come into focus at different points. So each each um, each wavelength has a different focal length. Uh, and but this this is an issue for color images, but uh, really for narrow band, you know, uh, narrow band is just one color. So if you can, if you have the ability to focus on uh, on that color uh, as you switch filters and maybe do uh, hydrogen alpha uh, you can focus on hydrogen alpha and then oxygen three you can you can change focus and, and go to oxygen three um, but for for color images you'll have this smearing and, and maybe if you focus on the green you'll have uh, blue or red have more of a bloat uh, attributed to it uh, and that's really uh, you know, this chromatic aberration is, is really, um, re happens a lot in doublets. It happens very strongly in singlet lenses. After all, when you look at a singlet lens, it acts just like a prism, and a prism just creates a dispersion in light in, in colors. And that's effectively what this, um, what this is doing with, with those types of systems. Uh, one way to combat chromatic aberration is to have a, a triplet design system with good color correction. Another way is to have a telescope which only has reflecting surfaces. So a, a Ritchie, a Dahl Kirkham, or a Cassegrain system only has reflecting surfaces, and, and there's no um, there's no refraction, no dispersion of light in that case. Okay, and then coma. So uh, coma is uh, present in a lot of different designs. Probably most popular. Uh, popularly known in Newtonian designs. Um, and it's kind of the off-axis analog of spherical aberration. So the more off-axis the angle is, the, the more sort of um, uh, deformation in the star shape you'll have. So this outer, outer band of, of light uh, with high impact parameter on the, on the lens will be smeared more towards the center. And then the the inner band of light will effectively continue on uh, straight on. So you see that this one object that's off axis with some angle here uh, will have the smearing in the lateral direction, and that's what that's what coma looks like. So this is um, this is the shape that's often uh, shown, where you have this uh, very circular um, outer edge, and then um, it kind of looks more like a more like a cone, uh, in a sense. And so this is this happens a lot in reflectors, uh, and it goes with the the third power of the focal ratio. So if I have um, an example I wrote out here, if I have an f four uh, Newtonian, and I compare the the coma that exists in an f four Newtonian with an f eight Newtonian, um, it'll have roughly eight times as as much coma. So that would be two to the, to the third power. Um, so two would be from the ratio of these focal ratios, and then the third power uh, is the the increase that you would get. So a factor of eight more uh, coma in this faster system than the than the slower system. And then you can add a coma corrector to um, to correct for this as well. And um, uh, let's see, do I have? Yeah, that's that comes later, I guess. Um, so yeah, it. That, that kind of segues into the reflector, which um, the reflector is a great, um, uh, a great system. I, I like the reflector because it has, um, it, 
it's kind of a light bucket. I mean, the Dobsonian revolution, the whole light bucket thing, that's great for visual. Uh, it's also good for imaging too. You can have a very large aperture system um, that uh, collects light very quickly. Uh, and these coma correctors really make imaging with the reflector um, uh, make sense. Whereas before you were limited to a very small uh, area on the center of the chip without much coma, these coma correctors can can really expand that area so that you can do really good imaging with these. Um, so yeah, like I said, the, the great thing about these is that they can be large aperture. Uh, this one imaged, uh, uh, this one in the photograph is a 10 inch aperture, uh, Newtonian. Uh, typically they're very fast, so less than F5. Uh, this example is F4. And, but some of the drawbacks are that the, you need a big mount to, to carry it and, and to track it with the stars. Uh, it needs collimation. So sometimes depending on the mechanics of your Newtonian, it'll need frequent coll collimation, maybe collimation every night you drag it out. Um, it will need some cool down time. So the mirror uh, can have a boundary layer of, of warm air over it, depending on if it's equilibrated. And that can, can kind of mess up the, the image. You'll have some thermal currents inside the tube that can affect um, how the light gets collected onto the chip. So you might have some flaring of a star uh, in that case. And uh, that, that's a good sign that you, you just want the, the telescope to cool down a little bit more. So there are some systems that allow you to cool down the primary mirror faster with uh, boundary layer fans or, or maybe a primary mirror fan on the very back of the telescope that, that lets you draw air over that boundary layer to scrub it and, and to remove it so that you get good, um, good stable air in your tube. Uh, and then, like I said before, the, the coma corrector uh, is kind of an essential accessory for Newtonian imaging. Um, there are a lot of coma correctors out there, um, battery, telescope service, teleview, uh, and so on. I'm using the, uh, for this is my telescope, and I'm using with it the Paracore, and it gives a slight Barlow effect, so it turns my F4 into an F4.6 telescope, but it's worth, that, that trade-off is worth it, um, because the performance is, is very good. Um, and the back spacing is around 56 millimeters. So it, it works with um, almost all uh, astronomy cameras out there. Um, okay. Questions about Newtonians or any of the optical, <clears throat> optical aberrations I talked about? Yeah, uh, Gabe, Gabe I, would, I would add one more drawback to the Newtonian is, Actually, uh, is that the primary mirror is subject to pollutants and dust and dust bunnies and people making nests in there. I mean, how, how, how easy is it to get, gain access to clean that primary? Um, at least on the design that I have, you can see this is a dust cap. Um, it's a fabric dust cap. You can just take it off. Right. And uh, these hex bolts allow you to unscrew the, the rear cell. And the rear cell is very robust here and you just take out the rear cell um, and you have immediate access to the mirror. So if you need to um, get an air blower to kind of get the dust bunnies off or, or whatever, you can do that uh, pretty easily. With other systems, um, I, I've seen good designs, I've seen bad designs. So it just d depends on the telescope. But with this system, I've been very impressed with, um, with how easy it is to, to service it. Uh, actually, the mirror itself is... Uh, uh, on the rear, it's a, it's a conical mirror, so it's not a, a flat mirror. That conical mirror allows it to, to cool more quickly. But on the rear of that, that cone is a, a threaded insert that allows you to thread it into the cell. So there are no mirror clips or anything like, like that to cause diffraction artifacts um, that are often seen in a lot of really deep integrations with uh, Newtonians. Uh, so to service it, to maybe recode it, to get it refigured, all I would do is pull the cell out uh, by unscrewing those bolts uh, and unscrew the mirror from, from the cell. And it's, it's really that easy. So you never really have to get close to touching the surface of that mirror. Uh, so it's, um, in this case, it's a, it's a good, uh, good system. All right. Um, so we can move on to, other designs, uh, Cassegrain designs. Um, these are reflecting only surfaces. Uh, 
the some examples are the Ritchie uh, Cretin, I think. If, correct me if I'm wrong in the pronunciation. Um, they are formed with only hyperbolic mirrors, and because they're hyperbolic, it's a lot more difficult to to manufacture, and a lot more difficult to align. Uh, I've had two of these types of telescopes before. One was an eight inch, and one is the the other one pictured here, the, the ten inch uh, truss design. The ten inch design was uh, easier to to work with because the mechanics were were better, but it was still very frustrating to to get good collimation with. Um, because they're hyperbolic, the, just the degree of exactness you need to get for column, good collimation is, is really, really high. Uh, but that said, once for these types of GSO import Richies, once you set the collimation, almost always they hold for a very long time. So it's usually just a, maybe a night or several uh, of fighting it. And then once you have it, it's, it's solid. I had, it does have some residual field curvature. So um, whenever I use these telescopes, I used uh, an additional reducer uh, field flattener that's designed for refractors, but it also works just as well for this telescope too. Um, the biggest, uh, because yeah, the field curvature is probably the biggest um, aberration and because of that, it's used a lot in scientific studies. So for example, the Hubble Space Telescope is a Ritchie. Uh, there are a lot of other examples out there that, that are Ritchie design. Um, the, the pros are that it's great for photometry. In photometry, you really don't care about um, if your stars are, are all not in focus. So the field curvature is really irrelevant to pho photometry for scientific studies because all you care about is that the light is collected in a circular disk and you could just increase your, your aperture uh, for measuring how much light is or how much flux is contained in those pixels. Uh, if you have some weird aberrations where the light is scattered along one direction, like in coma or anything like that, that's more of a serious issue that you can't really easily correct for. So that's why these Ritchie designs are, are used a lot in scientific studies. The other um, Cassegrain I have listed here is a Dahl Kirkham, um, and it's a bit easier to collimate, I believe. Um, I, I've never owned one, but uh, it has an elliptical primary and spherical secondary, and, and because of those two, uh, it makes it uh, easier to collimate than the Ritchie. Um, for imaging, uh, the corrected Dahl Kirkham, which has um, a flattener element in, inside the tube, is often used. So like uh, plane wave telescopes, AG optical, those, those manufacturers um, develop these types of scopes with these re uh, correctors in the tube to, to get a perfectly flat um, and large Im imaging circle at the focal plane. Uh, for the Ritchie, I just added a field or a focal reducer and, and that works. Uh, okay, so from Cassegrain to CATS, catadioptric. These are just a mixing of reflecting surfaces and refracting surfaces. Um, that, that's what the catadioptric uh, name means. And uh, it, it has several uh, benefits and several drawbacks. I, I'd say that the cats are usually um, kind of a, a jack of all trades. Um, usually they're mass produced. And so if, if you're looking for a very, very high strail ratio type uh, system, um, it, it can be uh, kind of difficult to, to find one that, that, that fits those, uh, you know, those specs. The, the benefits are that it's a folded design. So you can have a very long focal length telescope in a very compact uh, package. And that's great for things like planetary uh, imaging. It's great for uh, imaging very small galaxies or planetary nebulae. Uh, because the, the mirrors are spherical, it's very easy to collimate. Um, and there's usually, if you're off in miscollimation a little bit, it's, it's not going to severely impact your images. Um, some of the, the drawbacks are that it is a closed system. So the Cassegrain um, and the Newtonian have this open end over here. There's, there's no um, interface here to, to keep air uh, inside. In the, in the in SCTs, uh, catadioptric systems, 
there, there is no way for this air to kind of mix freely with the outside air unless you have uh, a system that has fans on the side or, or, or a fan through the secondary or the, um, I've also seen systems where you can put a fan in here and then just purge the air through here as well. Uh, so having this closed system make it makes it a lot more difficult to to reach thermal equilibrium, and so your images might suffer in the early part of the night with these types of scopes if they're if they're not properly cooled down. Sorry, my speaker just went haywire. I hope it wasn't too loud. <laughs> uh, all right, okay, uh, and then. The other drawback of these things is that uh, you can get dew on the front corrector plate and that can be addressed with a dew shield or a dew heater um, as necessary. Okay. Um, so these are, are like SCTs um, and, and those have, uh, do have fuel curvature and in some cases they can be uh, kind of strong. So uh, probably the past 10 years or so the, these corrected SCTs came out. Um, uh, I know of, in, in terms of sort of popular uh, release, I know of two sort of main classes, the Edge HD from Celestron. Um, I've had several of these and I, ha I have an 11 inch version now. I believe uh, G-Scope is a 14 inch version uh, and it's at F11. Uh, this has uh, a corrector element in the baffle tube back here. And what that does is it, it'll just correct for that field curvature and give you a very nice flat um, image circle. Uh, there are some other aberrations, but they're very small. Um, they're hardly noticeable, but uh, if, if you do get uh, sort of a, a, a bad copy, then, then they will be more noticeable. Uh, it does have built-in fans, so those types of things can help with the thermal equi equilibration. And you can also buy an optional 0.7x reducer uh, to turn your system to an F7 or F7.7. There's also the Mead ACF uh, system. It's coma free, but also but it's advertised as coma free to to help correct. But it also has that uh, pretty strong uh, field curvature. Um, so I think given these two, I'd probably choose the Edge if if I only had to choose one. All right, questions. I hope you guys can still hear. <laughs> All right, other designs. Um, the, this is sort of the miscellany uh, portion. I I just threw this uh, up with a couple designs that were interesting to me. Um, I know there are a lot of other designs out there, but but these are more widely available. Uh, the Rasa, which is the Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph, um, it's a very very fast system. It's kind of the replacement of. Um, the edge edges hyperstar which you would take this secondary mirror out put in a corrector element and then put your camera on it and you would turn this sct from an f10 or 11 into an f2 system uh and that that was um uh that that's really great and allows you to do very fast imaging in f2 uh some of the drawbacks of the Hyperstar or Faststar, I think the earliest incarnation was Faststar from Arizona, um, is that it's not really well corrected um, beyond a, a small chip. So if you want to put like an APS crop sensor or a full frame sensor on this, you're going to have some really weird stars at the very edge of that frame. Um, and the the Rasa uh, is uh, was designed to to counter that argument is that you can put a full frame sensor on the Rasa on the 11 inch Rasa and have uh, great stars to the edge of your field of view and still image at F2. Well, the 11 inch would be F2.2. Um, so I, I have the eight inch version of this and have used it with an APS um, crop sensor uh, and, and have been very, really pleased with how well it's corrected even at, at the edge of that field, uh, at the edge of the chip there. Um, the only drawback of this is that um, because you have a camera hanging off the end of your tube, you're going to have wires going from the camera out to the edge of the tube, and you're going to have uh, star, um, you know, star artifacts from diffracting uh, off the wires. So there are a couple of approaches. One is to uh, make it look like a reflector, um, something that I'm, I'm sure Dennis would probably cringe at, to make it look like it has. Uh, 
has a, a, a spider veins holding a secondary mirror. The other is to make these, um, these uh, wires coming off more curved. And if you make them curved, then if there's no uh, sharp lines or anything and the curve is symmetric, then it will dis disperse the light in a symmetric manner. So it, it doesn't have any strong flaring in one direction or spikes from diffraction. And so that's that's uh, some of the drawbacks of the Rasa. Uh, again, you know, it has the same drawbacks here for, with dew from catadioptric systems. It has a closed system, but it also includes a, a fan to, to help equilibrate it. I hear they can be really hard to calibrate and stay calibrated. Is, are you finding that to be true? Uh, I've had it for about a month and a half, um, and I've imaged it with it with only a few nights. So I, I can't really say to that. Um, Chad would probably be one to to ask uh, of our local group because he's he's had his for a while now and has been doing a lot of imaging with it. Um, that said, uh, I found no issues with collimation uh, for the copy that I got. I put um, I put the camera on and and took images and and it looked fine. It looked good. Uh, the other system is um, a hyperbolic Newtonian. And what this is, is a hyperbolic uh, primary mirror, uh, flat secondary, and then a corrector element. Uh, and this one operates at f2.8. This is a sharp star copy. Um, there, it's, it's kind of a copy of the Takahashi Epsilon design systems. They run at f2.8 and f3.3. This is a 150 millimeter um, uh, system. I think the Takahashi Epsilons are at 130 and 180 millimeter. Uh, but these are also excellent for um, fast imaging. In the end, I, I did return this though because it did have some um, some quality issues. Uh, I believe uh, I, I ordered this from Astronomics. I believe from Agena, they offer a, a quick kind of thorough overview before they ship it to you. Um, it's the same price, so I think if I were to ever do this again, it, it would be through them. Uh, but yeah. And again, this, this, because as a secondary, it would have um, spider vein diffraction spikes on all the stars. All right. Uh, any questions about optical designs or aberrations or anything like that? Okay. All right, filters. Um, so there are, uh, you know, when we're imaging, we have uh, the opportunity to use a lot of different filters. And filters, uh, we want to use the ones that are best for our skies. Um, sometimes our skies are really, really bad. So we want to use, in this case, uh, light pollution filters to try and reject that background sky as much as possible. And this is a spectra, um, sort of a cartoon, spectra, uh, cartoon spectra of emission lines from nearby street lights or, you know, maybe your, your neighbor's um, uh, street lamp. Um, and those emission lines sit at very well-defined wavelengths. So just like with uh, emission line, Im like narrowband imaging, you can choose to accept those, uh, the light coming in from stars that have very defined uh, wavelengths. You can also choose to reject um, nearby light that has very well-defined wavelengths. So these light pollution filters um, work really best on uh, emission lines from from like uh, sodium street lamps and so on. Uh, it operates under the assumption that you can take this image, which has a lot of sky background, just contamination from those street lights, reject all that and still accept a lot of the really good light that you wanna keep and you have an image like this. And then when you stack all these images, you get something like this in the end. So you could presumably do this from, from in, a, in a very light polluted area. Uh, because the idea of the light pollution filter is to reject these emission lines, uh, it will not work on light that's spread broadly over this, and that's called broadband emission. So things like moonlight um, are not good. Incandescent lights, not good because that's a broadband emission. And then more recently, a lot of, um, because of cost-cutting measures for electricity consumption, a lot of lamps are being replaced from things like sodium vapor, um, sodium mercury vapor into these LED lamps that have um, broadband emission. So these, these things are great for you know, saving money, uh, but not so great for astronomy, unfortunately. And I think it's probably gonna be um, what we're confronted with in the future more and more. 
All right, so the, uh, the opposite of this, where we want to reject the, the emission light that we don't like, we want to accept the emission light that we do like. This is the emission uh, for, this, this would be for an emission nebula. Uh, it wouldn't really work on um, reflection nebula, galaxies, anything like that. But for emission nebula where, for example, in this case, H alpha, there are several filters with different band passes that you can use. Uh, and the tighter the band pass, the better contrast you'll get against the background sky. So this is an example that's found on uh, Astrodon's website where they show the Crescent Nebula in a very wide uh, red, narrow red. No idea what those mean in terms of wavelengths, wavelength band pass, but to compare those with um, H alpha at nine na nanometer uh, width, six nanometer and four nanometer. And you can see the contrast is greatly enhanced the stars themselves are reduced because the stars are broadband emission and you're cutting more of that broadband emission out. Uh, but your contrast is getting a lot better as you, as you um, decrease the band pass. Uh, I think this was probably an older version because a lot of filters now are uh, seven, seven or eight nanometer, five nanometer. And I think the best I've, I've seen are three nanometer. Um, uh, and also with the increasing or decreasing uh, band pass, you're going to have increasing cost as well. So these are more expensive to fabricate, I think. Um, so with, with uh, narrow band filters, um, as you, you might think that if you decrease this even more, you're, you're just going to get even better contrast and it's true. But if you have a very fast system, uh, that is kind of counterproductive because with a fast system, the, um, the angle that the, that the light comes in and, and uh, is incident on the filter can have a, a big impact on the transmission. And this is a, a study I did um, a couple months ago where I'm looking at the, uh, the angle, the maximum cone angle of different telescopic systems. Um, at f2, f2.84, and 4.6, and comparing uh, what the transmission profile for an oxygen three, uh, oxygen three filter with three nanometer, uh, I think, yeah, three nanometer uh, band pass looks like at native. Um, what I mean by native is just the light is incident uh, directly on the filter. It's not at an angle. And as if you go at a very steep angle, that band pass gets shifted by some amount. So if I'm operating at f4.6, which is the case with my new Newtonian uh, with the coma corrector, uh, the new band pass looks like this. So at the line, at the oxygen three line, I get a slightly reduced transmission at that maximal um, hmm. incident angle. <laughs> it gets even more drastic as you go to f2. So at f2 with three nanometer uh, filter, I wouldn't really even hope to see anything. Um, just because the band pass gets shifted so much. And that's the case for, for the other uh, wavelengths as well. So, um, so yeah, this is a real effect. Uh, at three nanometers, it's, it's below like F4, you're, you're kind of, it's, it's gonna be tough to get a, a decent image. Uh, you, there are a couple things that you can do. One is have a, a filter that has wider, nano, uh, wider band pass. So instead of this, um, this peak being very narrow, it's, it's just a bit wider to accommodate that, uh, that shift. The other one is to buy specially designed filters for high, uh, high focal ratio systems. Um, and I think Batter makes one, Astronomic might be coming out with one um, uh, that are relevant for F2. And, and that's the system, again, that I mentioned before, the Rasa system that has um, F2 and F2.2. There are also some camera lenses that operate in this realm, F2.8, uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the premium telephoto lenses uh, are at f two point eight. You can get some down to f two. I think the Rokinon, I think the Rokinon is down to f two. Rokinon one thirty five millimeter, and then there's a Sigma that operates at a really crazy f one point four, um, where that can be. Um, I mean, you 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 would really have to use a really wide uh, filter for that, or just kind of abandon <laughs> doing uh, narrow band filter and uh, narrow band imaging with with something like that or <clears throat> shell out some money for a custom job I think mm -hmm. 
uh, for designing that filter. Um, and this is kind of a high level summary of, of what that looks like. So along here is the F ratio of your optical system. So say I have a ref refractor at F7, I'm at oxygen, I'm using oxygen three. Um, I can expect a bandpass shift of roughly 0.4 um, uh, nanometer. And then I have overlaid on here uh, three nanometers. So it's actually one and a half here, but this would be the three nanometer shift, five and then eight nanometer shift. And so you see at F4, we're kind of cutting it close. Um, it is still probably okay. At F2, it's gonna be really hard at, at eight nanometer. You're gonna have some, some odd, um, odd looking uh, higher contrast areas in the center of your frame and then less mm -hmm. contrast in the outer part of your frame in those cases. All right, so that's narrowband. Um, LRGB is great for uh, things like um, galaxies, star clusters. And uh, it's really just a collection of two different types of filters. The luminance is just get as much detail as you can. I accept all the light as equally um, as, as possible. And it's just cutting out the UV and IR typically where things like refractors are not well corrected for. It's just looking at the stuff in the color band. Um, and yeah, it's, it's used to get some really great detail. People typically on high mag or high image scale systems uh, use luminance at one by one binning uh, and then uh, get color through RGB at lower resolution using two by two binning uh, and then combine those in post to, to get a good detail and good color uh, image. Uh, the RGB, if they're designed right, can have um, a, a slight light pollution filter, uh, light pollution emission rejection. For example, the astrodons here, they have this very wide gap between green and red where a lot of emission lines uh, sit. And those, um, you know, this gap here will, will prevent uh, unwanted uh, light pollution from spoiling your, your color images for green and red. Uh, some tips on cleaning and installing filters. So some filters, they, they come mounted uh, and it's really easy to just screw them into your filter wheel or screw them onto your camera directly. Other filters are more difficult to handle. Uh, they're unmounted. And uh, I just wanted to show kind of my process for cleaning them. Um, I've, had, uh, I've had filters like this for about 10 years on and off now. And um, I try to get it so that there are no dust motes at all on my filters. Uh, and for the most part, I'm pretty successful with that. Um, uh, the reason for that is I don't wanna have to continually take new flats every single night because there's a dust moat on my, uh, on my filter. And then, it, you know, maybe by moving the filter wheel, the dust moat changes, I have to get new flats. It's just more of a hassle. So I, I tend to just do f uh, flats once every, I don't know, once every three months or so and uh, update them pretty infrequently. Uh, and you can do that if you don't have a lot of dust on your, on your uh, filters. So what I do in the first step is just take a blower like this rocket blower down here um, and uh, do a, a firm squeeze on all the filters just to make sure that there's no dust on it, no, no loose dust that can be blown away with the filter, uh, with the blower. It's very key never to use compressed air, um, especially in those cans because there's a propellant in the cans that can, you know, if, if you spray it on your, your filter, you're actually gonna do more harm than good. It's, it's gonna contaminate the filter and you're gonna have to clean it. Uh, after the fact. Also, the air that comes out of those cans can be very, very cold, uh, and that might thermally shock your, your filter. Uh, then I do a microfiber wipe just to get, um, just to get the remainder of the dust off that wasn't done with the, um, with the blower. And these microfiber wipes can be, you know, they can get them on Amazon or something. Uh, and then a, a, a good solvent to uh, I spray a good solvent on, on the surface and then uh, take the microfiber wipe again to it, making sure there are no streaks. Uh, never use the same part of the microfiber wipe twice. You don't want to recontaminate with something you've already wiped off. <clears throat> and, um, and yeah, that, that's it. I do it on both sides and I never touch um, the, the surface, e even <laughs> though these, these filters may be hard coated. Um, I never touch the surface uh, with my fingers. I don't want to get any oils or anything on them. So in order to bring them out of a, a carousel like this, where it's 
uh, heavily recessed, I use a, a wooden toothpick to get in between and, and to, to raise it uh, to get them out of the cell. Um, and then I just drop them back in. And then as a final step before I close everything up, I use a blower again to, to make sure that there's no dust. What solvent do you, do you use? Yeah, so um, I got a, 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 a bottle of, it, it's kind of a, a mixture of, uh, what is it, isopropyl, it, it's like rubbing alcohol, un, unfragranted rubbing alcohol with um, Kodak Photo Flow, I think, where um, it, it's a kind of a recipe that uh, an astronomer friend of mine gave me, mm. and I've been using that one bottle for the past um I don't know, six or seven years now. Mm -hmm. I can give you, I can, I can send the, the ingredients afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, it's a small one with a little, little spray nozzle. So I don't have to um, apply it, apply any liquid. It's, I can make it in a sort of a, not truly an aerosol, but you know what I mean? You just spray it. All right. Questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the last por little portion, I know we're kind of running be behind on time. Last little portion, I wanna just have a little fun and, and look at star shapes. Um, so this is partly optics um, and partly the, the sensor uh, air, uh, realm. So there are a couple of th things why we wanna be interested in star shapes. Uh, one is it will tell us like what the optical aberrations are in our systems, what kind of issues we might have mechanically. Um, and there are a few tools to help us diagnose them. One is a CCD inspector, which I, I know some of us use. I've never used it before, but I know it can, can help you with uh, dialing in uh, spacing and collimation. Uh, you can also use it on the computer that you're using to directly acquire these images. So I know there's like this way that it can, it can just monitor a, a directory and then it'll just update as the new files are coming in, um, how things look, which is really nice. Uh, there's also PixInsight. Uh, I use Aberration Inspector uh, quite a bit. That's what this is. It just gives you uh, an, a three by three panel of the upper leftmost, uh, upper rightmost, and, and so on. All these little uh, sub panels of your image and uh, shows you the star shapes at the extreme corners, the edges, and the center. Um, and I find this pretty invaluable to have all these in, in one kind of um, one view because if you if you have the image in front of you and you're just looking around manually first of all you have to zoom in on some of these chips to, to actually resolve the stars to see the star shape and then uh, the other is just the act of like moving your head around you, you kind of lose your bearing a little bit to, to more properly diagnose what the star shapes are in relation to each other um, I also use full with half max eccentricity that it's a script in PixInsight and that's more of a, both of these are more of an offline process. I, I don't know, I don't have PixInsight installed on any of my acquisition computers, so I usually use these as offline things. Um, so uh, question, what's, uh, what's the issue with this one? Let's diagnose some star shapes. Field rotation. Field rotation, okay. It looks like bad tracking to me. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so something really weird is going on. Uh, this is a probably a decent integration, judging by the color of the ring nebula. But um, because we do have weird tracking here and weird tracking here, they're not tracking together. I, uh, and because you have this star field here that is that is not having that effect, tells me that that was probably the guide star and the uh, right. polar alignment was way way off uh where the guide the guiding system is tracking on this star but because our polar alignment is off there is this field rotation that's occurring uh in the frame and we're getting very bad uh very bad star shapes away from the guide uh star so this is an example of field rotation due to bad polar alignment um all right so very good uh what's this one what's the issue with this image this is one I took a um, long time ago. Looks like an unflat field. Okay. Separations in the corners, it's, it's sharp in the center. Okay, yep. 
So we can, we can use the aberration inspector to accentuate this. Um, and yeah, the, the stars at the edge mm -hmm. have extreme uh, field curvature <laughs> and the stars in the center are, are decent. And this was, I think this was like the first year I started imaging. I didn't have a field flattener at the time. So that's what I needed to, to add to the system. Uh, this is a very extreme case where we have this extreme elongation um, and the, the field curvature is really, really clear here. Uh, in some cases, when you do even add the field flattener and your backspacing is off a little bit, you'll still have this kind of flaring or, or larger, um, you know, larger star shape at the edge or at the corner compared to the center. All right, this one is more difficult, um, mainly because the pixel scale is a lot smaller. So uh, let's look at the aberration inspector of it and see if we can kind of figure out what's going on. Uh, in the center, the stars look good. Um, over here, there's sort of this weird shape star. Uh, it's kind of, kind of triangular almost. Over here, it looks like maybe there's some tracking uh, elongation. Uh, these look okay. These look not too bad. So uh, what's going on here? If we go into PixInsight and use the full width half max eccentricity um, tool. We're presented with this where you can select the image, you click measure and it populates these fields for the, the, mean, mm -hmm. the median full width half max, the eccentricity and all these little um, data summaries here. You click support, you're presented with these two figures. Mm. The first one is full width half max across your star field. So this is somewhat similar to the CCD inspector view where you have varying colors to indicate uh, mm. the full width half max. But this is native within uh, PixInsight. And you can see that the, the full width half max at the top is quite a bit larger than that at the bottom and that the eccentricity is larger at the top than that at the bottom. So what do we think that's from? Astigmatism. Okay, so the astigmatism um, might be indicative from this triangular shape you're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, that That's a good point. However, uh, it's not too apparent in the other stars, I would say. Um, and considering the fact that most of the star shape uh, is most of the stars up here are bloated and most of the stars down here are tighter um, would lead me to con uh, conclude that it's more of a tilt issue where we have better focus down here than up here. And indeed this was because my, the collar, the locking collar on my refractor was a little bit loose. And the next night I came out um, and tightened it and this, this went away. So uh, it was due to tilt where the focus plane is in, is in this direction. And maybe I focused on a star down here that brought uh, the focus plane to, to intersect down here. And these stars at the very top were, were just uh, not focused well. All right, and then this one sort of, I think the last one, um, this one's kind of a trick. Uh, it, there are some weird star shapes at the edge. Um, and really this is just uh, hitting the limitation of your reducer, um, reducer flattener. The image circle is not as large as the outer panels of this aberration inspector. Uh, it does cover the inner portions here. Uh, so those stars look decent. Uh, and this is just uh, uh, an issue with the image circle size versus the, the chip that I'm using. Um, I don't think it would be uh, a com complete diagnosis of star shapes without uh, telling you how to get the best back focus. I went over different uh, reducer and flatteners and, and how um, you can have residual field curvature with uh, those set improperly. So if you have a refractor and you have a, a reducer on here, like with what, this is a Borg um, 55 uh, uh, millimeter telescope, and it has a, a flattener uh, around here. 
And the way I'm able to dial in the backspacing is I have this, um, this batter Verilock system, which allows you to unthread this locking ring and then thread uh, the housing here on these, th on these threads to increase, uh, to decrease or increase the backspacing between the, the flattening element and your, your chip. And that's what I did. It took me uh, about half an hour, 45 minutes to dial it in where I was looking for this pattern. If, um, if I'm too far in, uh, then the stars will look like this, sort of a zoom effect. Um, and I need to increase the distance between the chip and the, uh, the flattener element. If I'm too far out and I need to bring it in, it'll have this whirlpool effect of the stars um, where there's more elongation in sort of this azimuthal direction uh, where it's more of a, a circle. And, and in the opposite case, it's more in the radial direction, away, f away from the center or towards the center. So by seeing this, uh, these two, this is a visual characterization of uh, whether you're too far in or too far out. The other way to do it is to focus on a star in the exact center and then, and then move the star to the edge of the field, focus again, and see where, whether you need to move the focuser in or move the focuser out. And depending on which direction you need to move the focuser to focus on the star out here, that tells you you need to bring the, uh, the chip in or out. Uh, and, and so that's one way to, uh, to diagnose whether you, you got the correct backspacing and something like this is, is really helpful. Uh, granted, this is a very short, uh, focus or back focus camera. I think it's 17 millimeter back focus. So I have enough room to, to have this type of mm -hmm. adapter, but you can also do the same sure. thing with shims. So you can, uh, um, increase the backspacing, put a couple of aluminum shins in, and then uh, clamp it down and then adjust or measure it and then adjust as needed. Um, this, this just makes it a lot easier if you, if you have that back focus um, that you can accommodate that. And then here are some other examples. Uh, pinched optics, usually a type of astigmatism, but if it's a Newtonian and the pinching is along this three principle design, uh, principal directions where the collimation screws are, um, Sorry, that can cause this pinching. Um, coma is another, uh, another one uh, due to miscollimation. Um, so that's what this one looks like. We've already gone through that. And then the different, um, different lenses, DSLR lenses have different aberrations. Um, and in some cases, some extreme, um, extreme uh, chromatic aberration. So, uh, that's it. Uh, next time, uh, Jeff is going to guide us through guiding. Um, and then after that, I'm going to do the electronics portion to talk about CCDs, CMOS and all that kind of fun stuff. So, um, sorry, it went a little bit long. Uh, like I said, there was a lot of stuff to cover in this one, uh, which is why I wanted to push electronics off until next time. Um, I'm happy to hear any comments or any other questions, um, and so on. So thanks guys. I actually have a question, but it might not be directly about optics. In one of your slides, mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about doing one by one uh, binning for luminance and then two by two for the RGB. Yep. Um, I, obviously, this is probably a really stupid question because no, 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 you wouldn't ahead. do RGB with a color camera, but I've, I've heard, I'm just curious, is there any benefit to binning with a color camera or does it not work? I, I, in my mind, I can't resolve binning working with a color camera because of the way the pixels are laid out. Yeah, I, I would say, um, I mean, others can say, uh, others can chime in too, but um, I haven't really seen binning with color being very popular or choice. I would say if you, because of the bare matrix, you're already losing roughly a factor of two in right. your mm -hmm. resolution. If you are very highly oversampled, it might make sense to bin uh, to get that sort of one arc second per pixel type <clears throat> image scale. Um, for example, if you're working at uh, a quarter arc second per pixel and then you have the RGB array or the bare array to lower the resolution, maybe binning two by two would make sense in that case. Um, but I don't think that's a common uh, scenario. So that might be why binning in RGB isn't talked about very often. Thanks. Very good, Gabe.
Yeah, very nice. Thanks. Thanks, guys.